good afternoon, everyone. Minasan, konnichiwa. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today for our webinar on the impact of the 2020 elections on immigration and insurance. Certainly, there's a whole lot happening uh, since the pandemic uh, with immigration and insurance, but with the upcoming elections, there's a whole lot more to consider and to, uh, to worry about moving forward, not only in 2020, but 2021. Uh, but we are so happy that you're able to join us today to learn about the secrets and intricacies uh, between each of the immigration and insurance worlds uh, moving forward with the election. Uh, my name is Yoshi Domoto. I am the executive director of the Japan America Society of Georgia uh, and will be with us today with uh, two panelists, uh, Mr. Jim Leonard from Barnes and Thornburg. Uh, and then we also have Miss Sarah Hawk from Barnes and Thornburg as well. Uh, certainly experts in both of their fields. We're so happy that they have joined us today. Uh, but without further ado, we would like to start off uh, and introduce to you to our co-chair of the Programs Committee of the Japan American Society, Mr. Jim Hoadley. Hoadley Sensei, dozo yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Thank you, Yoshi. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. You've kind of uh, done my self-introduction for me. Uh, I am the uh, co-chair of the uh, Programs Committee. Um, this is uh, one in our ongoing series of uh, webinars uh, on information that you need. And uh, I would say particularly, uh, no, not to slight Sarah at all, but uh, I think insurance is much more on people's minds right now, Jim, than, uh, than it was maybe even 24 hours ago. So uh, definitely a very uh, current topic to talk about. Uh, uh, I'll just give brief, uh, very brief introductions of the two uh, uh, panelists. Uh, Sarah Hawk is a partner uh, in immigration and global mobility at Barnes and Thornburg, and she has degrees from Agnes Scott and Georgia State. Uh, and Jim Leonard is a policyholder uh, uh, for insurance recovery and uh, for, works in policyholder insurance recovery and litigation attorney, uh, also for Barnes and Thornburg, and has two degrees from uh, Southern Methodist University. So thank you both for joining us. And uh, uh, which which one do we want to start with? Uh, Sarah, do you want to talk about immigration, or Jim, do you want to talk about insurance? I think I'll start off with the uh, with the insurance. And because we're talking about the potential impact of the election, and in the strong interest of wanting to be neutral in the webinar, I changed right before the uh, webinar began into a red and blue outfit. So. At the end of this, you should not be able to tell which side um, I voted for. So uh, <laughs> that's the goal for, for both of us. So again, thank you for joining us today. Um, so if, if you would go to the next slide. And I think this slide should be in the understatement folder uh, for the century to say that there is uncertainty right now in the insurance coverage market. Uh, it's, it, I'm 61 years old and I have been in the insurance business in the industry for 30 years, so 31 years now, uh, 22 years as a policyholder lawyer, and before that, nine years as uh, a, an insurance company representative, as the vice president of claims general counsel of a very large insurance company based here in Atlanta. So. I've seen, I've seen hard markets, soft markets, I've seen changes in the industry and so forth. I have never seen the type of uncertainty that underwriters are facing right now in 2020. So uh, you've got the pandemic, obviously, and the uncertainty that that brings. You have the election year with fiercely divided sentiments on both sides. And you have now, you know, you have rioting and civil commotion which if you go and look at your commercial policies, not nobody look, does that, but you should go actually look at your policy form because it'll say a special cause of loss that is expressly covered under your policy is riot and civil commotion losses, looting. So those damages are plainly covered. And so the insurance industry is looking at what's happening and those are all mounting costs for them because those are all pretty much clearly covered claims. Um, I saw this morning, uh, and so again, with regard to the election, I saw this morning in the Advise and Digest, uh, the headline that U.S. businesses splurge on insurance to protect against post-election chaos. 
So again, people are thinking in terms of, you know, what's going to happen when, if we have a very close election and it's, you know, in the courts or the House of Representatives and so forth, that there, there's potentially chaos there. So people are now buying up on their, uh, on their limits with regard to those types of losses. Uh, next slide, please. So again, we went, into, we went into January of 2020, really two months before the pandemic hit and shut everything down. We were already in a hard commercial market. So anyone who renewed your commercial policies January 1, you probably saw around a 20% increase in your premiums, regardless of your loss history. So we were in a hard market. It had been hardening for a number of years because of the cost of reinsurance going up. The reinsurance for those of you, and we're going to talk about that in connection with uh, what the issues are in 2020 and 2021. Uh, reinsurance, of course, is insurance that insurance companies buy to protect them from catastrophic losses. So reinsurers are people with very large bags of money that sit in Munich and Switzerland and, and the Caymans and Bermuda and, and England and so forth. And so what they do is they help a Travelers or Liberty Mutual or a company that's doing commercial business. And if they have a catastrophic loss, well, they have to pay out hundreds of millions of dollars for a hurricane, for example. Rather than take that loss right away, they turn to the reinsurers and the reinsurers pay them in accordance with their reinsurance agreement. That's, that costs money. And so as the reinsurance premiums go up, the commercial insurance premiums go up. And that's how we got into the hard market starting in January. And then you had COVID hit in March, all the shutdowns, and then the litigation beginning from that. Plus you have the election year, and that's all causing uncertainty with the underwriters, which is not good for underwriters. You have to understand that the insurance market is really the largest legalized gambling outfit in the world. Uh, every year they bet you, hey, I bet you, you don't have a loss this year, I'm gonna bet you your premium. And that's really what it works out to. It's, it's all about risk and managing risk and how do you respond to risk. And now we've got, as I said, like a perfect storm with everything happening this year. Uh, what's happened is with respect certainly to COVID, the insurance industry has circled the wagons. Uh, they, they are just nationally denying claims for business interruption loss, for property damage loss, in some cases, insureds received denial letters from their carrier before they submitted a claim. So you had some carriers out front writing letters to insured saying, we really appreciate that you're a customer, but we wanted you to know that COVID business interruption claims aren't covered under your policy. So you have a very strong position from the insurance industry that they didn't intend to cover this. Uh, and so, what we have is, is their response to the perfect storm is we're not going to pay any of these claims. Next slide. So this is the big question. And, and it's the question that goes to how this all potentially ties into the election. Um, COVID is unlike any other type of loss that I've seen in, in all of my years. It affects all lines of business. It affects all industries, professions large corporations, small corporations, small town, big town, everywhere. And so the industry is facing a unique catastrophic event. And in that situation, they have to be sure that if they were to have to start paying these claims, is there sufficient reinsurance out there in all those other jurisdictions offshore to pay them their reinsurance? Because if not, we're looking at a potential insolvency problem with insurance companies that would be unrivaled in our history. Some of the reinsurance spokespeople say there's not enough reinsurance capital to pay for these losses. Estimates, and it's hard to estimate how much the COVID virus has impacted uh, business interruption and business income losses, all of which would conceivably be covered. Uh, Estimates at one point where there you know, was three or $400 billion per month that was occurring. We're probably into the trillions, low trillions at this point. There are estimates that there are at least eight or $9 trillion 
in reinsurance capital available. So it would be an enormous hit to that industry. But, and so they're fighting, obviously, paying out those claims. Uh, in the meantime, because the reinsurers are at risk, their premiums are still going up. And that means your commercial premiums are going up. And what happens then is on the 2021 renewals, you're going to see your premiums go up even further. I'm talking with a client right now whose premiums, they had a, a, a September 1 renewal that we've still been working on that had a 1,200% increase in their premiums. So it's a serious, serious problem, and it's going to probably get worse in 2021. Next slide, please. So this is how it ties into the election and what may happen going forward. Um, right now, you have the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives that are all up for grabs. And the Democrats say that they're going to sweep all three. The Republicans say that they're going to sweep all three. And the only sure thing is that somebody's wrong. That's what we know. It's going to be one or the other or some mix. And so, again, with that uncertainty comes uh, the issue of what do we do next? Okay, so uh, next slide. Just putting, the, putting politics aside for a moment, what could be done to strengthen the marketplace, which would then help insureds have their claims paid. Uh, next slide. So back in March of this year, the, uh, the chair of the House Finance Committee, Maxine Waters, had prepared and presented uh, what was essentially a federal backstop for COVID claims and reinsurance. And if you see there, it's provide reinsurers with a TRIA-like government reinsurance facility. TRIA, is, as you may know, is the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, which was passed after 9-11 as a backstop for catastrophic terrorist events. And if, again, if you look at your commercial policies, you will probably see on there a charge for $527 for your terrorism risk insurance. And what that did was give the insurance industry a, a backstop of the federal government in the event of, again, another cabinet. We didn't know what was gonna happen after 2001. So there was a, a backstop in the event of a, of a massive uh, terrorist act. And so here, uh, what uh, Representative Waters had presented was something similar for COVID. Again, unprecedented uh, type of, of loss here. Uh, and what that would do was provide for uh, basically a cap where a reinsurer would be capped at a certain amount. You wouldn't have to get into the trillions, and that would be the responsibility of the federal government. It would also give insured businesses some level of certainty that their claims would be paid because part of this requirement would be the insurers would have to fund the business interruption claims up front and then seek reinsurance, and the reinsurance would be. The other aspect of this, and this is for me personally, a very frustrating aspect, and I'll explain why. The third point is that uh, the, the federal government could establish some degree of national insurance policy interpretation or enforcement. Because right now, it is a state by state determination. Um, insurance regulation has always been, or since the 50s, has been uh, left with the states. So the federal government, Karen Ferguson and so forth, they, they pretty much keep hands off. It's a state regulated problem. And so right now there's litigation going on across the country as to whether or not these COVID business interruption property damage claims are covered under the policies that have been issued to various business owners, restaurants, bars, all types of business, optometrists, physicians, and so forth. And so the frustrating thing is that depending on what state you live in will depend on whether or not your COVID claims are going to be paid. Think about that. So right now, and I looked at this as of this morning, if you live in Texas, Pennsylvania, Louisiana, Missouri, New Jersey, and North Carolina, 
your COVID claims are likely going to be, play, be paid because the court decisions in those states have already led in that direction, that they've, they've overruled motions to dismiss by the carriers and the cases are going forward. However, if you live in California, Florida, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, or Georgia, your COVID cases at this point won't be paid because courts in those states have already declined coverage and agreed with the insurance company. So it's incredibly frustrating uh, that, and again, you sometimes have federal courts deciding these issues and not the state courts. And so you have the federal court who's obviously not an elected uh, judiciary and you have them deciding questions of state law. Uh, what the federal government could do along with this backstop is to issue two simple mandates. Number one, that physical loss of covered property uh, as a result of the pandemic is a covered loss. Number two, the virus exclusions that are found in your commercial policy and mine uh, do not apply unless the insurance company can prove that COVID-19 was present on your facility. Those two things would make a world of difference with respect to policyholders. Now you may say, well, the federal government can't pass a law that changes the contracts. True, there'd be a constitutional argument, but again, if you look at your policies, you'll find that there is a provision in virtually all policies that says, if there is a change in the law or regulation after the issuance of this policy, the policy is automatically conformed to that subsequent law or regulation. So there are things that can be done to really help policyholders get the benefit of their bargain while still protecting on the back end the reinsurers by having this federal backstop. Unfortunately, when Representative Waters presented that, it never got to the floor. And that's because the insurance, the insurance industry spends a lot of your premium dollars on lobbyists. And they have a very, very, very strong lobbying presence in DC. And that, that uh, proposal never got to the floor of the house. It's something that could be done that could dramatically change the results with regard to insurance. Next slide, please. So, we looked at the two scenarios, but, you know, obviously there's a number of them, but what happens if the Democrats run the table and have the White House, the House of Representatives and the Senate? And of course, we had um, Ms. Waters' proposal for the, the TRIA-like pandemic backstop, which I believe would help significantly with having uh, claims paid uh, certainly more than they are now. I would say that as between the Democrats and the Republicans, it's probably more likely that the Democrats as a whole would be willing to pursue this type of legislation. The issue would be on what sort of basis could that actually get passed? And you know, the other question is in the list of priorities, if they control all three, where would that fall in the list of priorities getting that done? So there are questions as to whether or not that could actually get passed, but certainly uh, it, it came initially out of the, uh, the Democratic uh, run House. So there's, there's some potential for it in that scenario. Uh, if you go to the next one. So the other, the flip side, what happens if the Republicans keep the White House and the Senate and then gain the House and have have control. Where would this fall in the priorities? My sense is just based on what happened with the proposal in March of 2020, that we would probably not see a TRIA-like uh, pandemic backstop uh, from a Republican-held uh, legislature. It's not entirely clear to me that the administration would not consider this. I, I can tell you I looked at both the Trump and Biden websites this morning, and neither one mentions anything about a, a, a pandemic type backstop. Um, so again, it's, it may not be on the list of priorities. Uh, we, there are a few other things going on in the country right now, 
but it would be a, a great step forward uh, to help businesses get back on their feet and get back on them pretty quickly. So then next slide, please. So here's, here's the issue. So obviously many, many employers, many business owners uh, have January one renewals. And so with the election coming up next week, it's probably unlikely that it's highly unlikely that anything would get done that would directly impact the January one renewals. Uh, I think there will be coverage available. I think your premiums will be going up again. There doesn't seem to be any sort of uh, relenting in that area. Likely, do we end up with a divided government uh, as we have now with, with the Senate one hand and, and the House in the other? That may very well be what happens. It's, you know, it's gonna be close, however it turns out. But if that happens, then it's probably very unlikely that something like a TRIA pandemic backstop gets passed or legislation gets passed with regard to the language uh, interpreting the insurance policies that we all have. And then just my last point is that, you know, there is probably going to be opposition to this based on how far the national debt has grown. And that could also be a stumbling block to ultimately having something like this uh, put in place. Because again, you're looking at probably trillions of dollars in covered losses that the insurance industry has been fighting. And so there would have to be a provision put into place that some high degree of reinsurance would have to be paid first so that the backstop of the federal government and the national debt would not be, you know, multiple trillions of dollars but something less than that and require the reinsurance industry to participate heavily in it as well. But that's a lot of moving parts. The, um, it, would, it would take, I think, probably a united government under one party or the other to get something like this done. So I guess I would, I would probably end my comments with, um, you know, somebody's wrong, somebody's gonna be wrong and somebody's gonna be right. And uh, I, I just hope that as we move forward into whatever we're gonna be looking at come January, that we start thinking about bigger solutions for how we deal with the insurance coverage problem. Because we have to have availability of insurance but we also have to have those policies paying because the premiums are paid for this coverage and to go state by state as we're doing now uh, is just inherently unfair. It, it just doesn't make sense that somebody living, you know, two miles away in another state has coverage and the same business in our state does. So uh, with that, let me turn it back over to you, Professor. And then we Thank, can you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh... We'll, we'll talk more in a few seconds with, uh, when we have the, uh, the Q&A opening up, but I would ask uh, those who have questions, and uh, I'm sure uh, most of you have lots of questions already. Uh, there are a number that have been popping in my head. Uh, please use the Q&A tool, uh, the Q&A button below, as Yoshi has just indicated to you to uh, post your questions. So we move from the topic of insurance to the topic of immigration and what the upcoming election uh, will, how it will impact that. And for that, we turn to uh, Sarah Hawk. Um, Sarah, uh, I've already introduced you, so why don't we just go ahead and let you go ahead and start. I'm Sarah Hawk. I'm a partner at Barnes & Thornburg in Atlanta. I've been an immigration attorney for 20 years. I work with companies, universities, investors, entrepreneurs, artists, and athletes for their immigration needs. I'm glad to discuss the current immigration policies and options, especially now during COVID, in light of the presidential proclamations this year and the possible impact of the upcoming election. Now, as we know, immigration has been a vital part of companies' strategies in the global economy, and both the US and Japan have a mutual interest in attracting and retaining foreign talent with different immigration options. So here are the most common work visas. Thank you, Yoshi. The most popular is the H-1B work visa for professional occupations that require at least a bachelor's degree. 
H-1Bs are issued under a random selection process for new H-1B cases in a lottery system every year. There's an annual quota of 65,000 H-1Bs for bachelor's degree cases and another 20,000 H-1B slots for those with a U.S. master's or advanced degree. There's now an electronic registration system for the lottery, March 1 and March 20th for the limited H-1B visa spots. And the process heavily favors those with U.S. master's degrees. Now, H-1Bs have faced higher scrutiny under the current administration. We'll be discussing a new prevailing wage rule that is in effect now as of October 8th. And there's another rule coming up in December of this year that tightens the H-1B program. So every H-1B case must be strengthened as much as possible for approval. Now, the L-1 intercompany transferee visa is a very common work visa for multinational companies with various entities across the world. They transfer key employees from operations outside the U.S. If they have been employed at the other country's uh, uh, company for at least one full year out of the past three years, at either as a, as a manager or executive level under the L-1A option, or as a specialized knowledge employee under the L-1B option. Now, the advantage to L-1s is there's no quota for the L-1 visa category, and many companies based abroad are able to use the L-1 visa to open a new office in the U.S. Now, the TN classification is under the NAFTA, or now the USMCA Treaty, as of July 1st. And it does allow Canadian and Mexican citizens to apply for TN status to work in the U.S., mostly for positions that are professional positions that require at least a bachelor's degree. There's no quota for TN cases as well. And then the E-1, E-2 investor visa is a very common work visa for those with the same nationality as the company ownership from 70 different countries that have a treaty of, of navigation and commerce with the U.S. based on substantial trade or investment. Now, we see many companies from Japan, Germany, and other countries use the E-2 visa. E-2 visas are very common for startup companies and entrepreneurs who make a substantial investment in a bona fide business to, to actively direct and develop that business. Next slide. Now, shortly after the pandemic hit the U.S., the president did issue several proclamations, including COVID-related travel restrictions and immigration-related restrictions, with two significant proclamations in April and June of this year. There are a number of exceptions, including COVID-related exemptions, healthcare workers, food supply, and those who would be in the national interest. So the June proclamation went into effect on June 24th and bars the entry of new H-1Bs, L-1s, H-2Bs, and J-1s until the end of 2020. Now, uh, the proclamation is a, an extenuation of the initial proclamation in April that also um, stated the purpose was to protect U.S. workers' jobs in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. The earlier order in April this year placed a temporary pause on the processing of immigrant or green card cases filed outside the U.S. However, the new proclamation now extends that original ban on immigrant visas and now expands it to restrict work visas as well. Next slide. Now, what is the proclamation's impact on individuals in the U.S. with a valid status? So those who are outside the U.S. are impacted, but those who are inside the U.S as of June 24th, in a valid H-1B, L-1, J-1, O-N, T-N status are not included in this order. Also, students who are here in the U.S. in F-1 optional practical training, which is when you are allowed to work for one year after you graduate from university in the U.S., or STEM optional practical training are not affected by the proclamation. So it does affect those who are outside the U.S. as of June 24th, who do not currently have a valid non-immigrant visa and do not have an official travel document or another type of visa. Next slide. Now, in addition to the work visa proclamations, the travel-related orders started happening in January of this year, especially in light of, of countries with high COVID um, impacts. So China, Iran, Europe, the Schengen countries, Ireland, the UK, Canada and Mexico borders for land travel are closed except for commercial traffic and essential travel, and then Brazil as well. Now it's based on um, the physical presence of those who are in those countries, not the nationality. So if you are in one of those countries, 
then you would not be able to come to the U.S. directly unless you have an exemption um, if you were there for 14 days prior to entry to the U.S. So in some cases, we are allowed to get uh, people to the, uh, to the U.S. who are affected by these uh, travel restrictions if they first self-quarantine in another country that's not banned by the uh, travel order, such as Mexico. So they may have to come to Mexico first for 14 days and then come to the U.S. Now that allows those who are not impacted by the work visa restrictions who already have a visa, for example, and they're allowed to come to the U.S. So we've got two different types of, uh, of orders that have affected the travel related orders and the work visa proclamations as well. Uh, next slide. Now the impact on L1 and E2 visas and other NIV categories Basically, L1 petitions, both individual cases and what's called blanket L1 petitions requiring visa issuance of the U.S. consulates are barred from visa issuance unless one of the exceptions applies. So unfortunately, the L1 visa, which is very commonly used by Japan and by many other countries, um, are not allowed to apply for new entry into the U.S. Um, and that has affected many of our clients. Now, the E-2 visa applications are not impacted by the proclamation, which is great news, especially for Japanese companies who use the E-2 visa category quite extensively, especially for manufacturing companies and other companies as well. Um, it does not apply to E's, O's, P's, or TN visa categories. However, we, will, we have seen a higher level of documentary evidence for eligibility. So you want to make sure that if you're applying for the E-2 case, that you use a you know, competent legal counsel and you strengthen your cases as much as possible. Next slide. So just a little bit more about the E-1 treaty trader and E-2 treaty investor visas. Uh, this is based on a treaty with the U.S. and that country. The U.S. has 78 of these treaties and the national um, of the country can get the visa as a trader investor or an employee if they're executives, supervisors, or essential workers. Uh, the work visa is a five-year duration. You get a two-year period of admission every time you enter the U.S. You can file directly with the U.S. consulate or with the U.S. service center here in the U.S. And the good thing is for spouses, the E-2 dependent spouse can apply for work authorization um, as well to allow them to work in the U.S. Once they physically come into the U.S., they can apply for work authorization for spouses. Uh, next slide. And uh, this slide just gives you some of the documentary evidence that you'll need to have for a, for a strong E1 and E2 case, including company documentation, incorporation documents, an office lease space in the U.S., um, evidence of the funds that have been invested, uh, your sales, business plans, expenses, production, um, everything that shows your org charts, your, your anticipated employment of U.S. workers, of course, the individual's passport, resume, job offers, of the foreign applicant and very strong job descriptions and org charts as well. And next slide. Now, again, just a summary of the US work visas, the proclamations uh, do bar the entry of new H-1Bs, L-1s, H-2Bs, and J-1s until the end of 2020. It does not impact those foreign nationals here in the US already in valid status, HSLs, Js, O-1s, TNs, F-1 students, et cetera. Um, the service centers are still operating and they're processing cases. Uh, and also we're seeing an uptick in those who are filing for green card cases here in the U.S. through adjustment of status or those who are already green card holders and are eligible to apply for U.S. citizenship under the naturalization process. So that is not impacted by the proclamations. And next slide. Now the Trump administration did issue two new interim final rules on October 8th. Uh, these uh, new rules are already facing court challenge. Uh, they would further impact the H-1B program. Now they were issued as interim final rules without advance notice or comment. Um, there is a comment period, but they've already been effective for the prevailing wage requirement rule that went into effect on October 8th. Uh, the DH DHS rule that uh, requires the job is a, in a specialty occupation will take effect in December, December 7th of this year. Next slide. So further information on the DOL Department of Labor interim rule. It further restricts the H-1B program by raising the rate employers have to use for the required wage for an H-1B worker. So under the Immigration Nationality Act or the INA, employers must pay H-1B workers the higher of either the actual wage level, K-1 
paid to other similarly situated workers at the company or the prevailing wage level for the classification in the area of employment. Um, this is to ensure that foreign workers are not paid less than American workers. Um, however, it does change the wage levels at much higher percentiles. Next slide. So this gives you an idea of the increase. So for the um, prevailing wage determinations, uh, the increase in DOL wages, there are four different levels, level one, two, three, and four. And now the percentages have increased from each level to a higher level um, under the new interim final rule. So for example, level one was at the 17th percentile, now it's at the 45th percentile. And the next slide, will show you an example of that. This is for a software developer occupation in the Newark, New Jersey a metropolitan statistical area. And as you can see, before the interim final rule, level one wage was $78,811. Now, as of October 8th, that, that wage is now $116,251. So there's a 47% increase in that. And you can see levels two, three, and four also have higher uh, wage increases. Now it does depend on the uh, work location. So um, you know, if you're not in a major city, the wage increase may not be that high. And um, many um, companies also already pay high wages for these individuals. Uh, they're in very uh, competitive markets and we see computer occupations already getting paid a higher wage. So this may not affect uh, companies that have, um, are bigger in uh, size, but it may impact smaller companies uh, in universities, uh, nonprofits, um, if their wages are at a lower wage. Next slide. Uh, there's already three lawsuits regarding uh, these new interim wage um, rules and the H-1B rule. So we're anticipating there may be an injunction on the prevailing wage rule. I will have to wait and see, but this is the reaction of the business community and higher education. Uh, there has been a strong reaction because the rules went into place without really the normal comment and notice period. And uh, because of that lack of procedural uh, review, uh, these uh, lawsuits have already been um, filed uh, against these new rules. Uh, now the new H-1B specialty occupation rule goes into effect December 7th, and it really does narrow the fields of study that are considered to be a specialty occupation it also limits how the employees are working under the employer-employee relationship. Uh, it really sets a limit, a one-year limit, on the placement of H-1B workers at customer sites. And it really does restrict certain industries' use of the H-1B category, such as IT consulting companies. Uh, the new H-1B rule would also uh, impact the direct relationship requirement between the degree field and the duties of the position. So general degrees in engineering, liberal arts, business, without a specialization or explanation are not going to be sufficient. So many um, individuals may have a computer job uh, title, but they had a degree in chemistry or engineering. So sometimes we have to use uh, what's called an experience uh, work uh, credential valuation that shows that they're a combination of work experience, say they have six years of computer work experience, in addition to their um, degree would be the sufficient um, relationship to, um, to be eligible for the H-1B. Uh, so you really need to review your individual's cases closely. If you're going to sponsor someone in H-1B status, uh, the lottery system starts up for next year. We're already getting interest from companies to file for the H-1B cases for next year, but the companies will really need to take, pay attention to these new rules. And also the lawsuits, if there are injunctions on those as well, and then, of course, uh, the next slide will talk about the possible impact of the elections. Uh, next slide. So under the current administration, um, we would expect to see continued restrictions on immigration and a likely impact on smaller and medium-sized companies due to the higher prevailing wages. Uh, there will be a continued emphasis on compliance and enforcement. Uh, we have already seen an increase in ICE audits and I-9 audits for companies and that would relate to your I-9 compliance um, forms that you have for all your employees. So make sure you do an internal audit of your I-9 forms, as well as your hiring practices for your, um, for your workers. Um, under the current administration, if it continues, there should be an, an increase in um, immigrant and non-immigrant prohibitions. Uh, so you'll see more of the same types of uh, work visa bans. 
um, and proclamations that may continue into 2021. And then also there may be a possible merit-based point system, which could possibly end the family-sponsored categories and DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals uh, system. And so if there is a merit-based point system, that would radically change immigration for both family and employment-based immigration. If um, after the election, there is a Biden administration, there will likely be a reinstatement or relief for the DACA program or DREAMers that would allow them to stay in the US. Uh, there could possibly be a reversal of the family separation for, pam for people who are detained at the border. Uh, there would likely be an end to workplace raids, although we have seen I-9 audits continue with, with any type of administration. And then there should be a slow rollback of restrictions policies, depending on the pandemic and Congress, because normally immigration changes have to go through Congress. Uh, immigration is a federal uh, program. And so any major changes should go through Congress. However, under the current administration, we have seen many proclamations uh, without going through Congress. And then finally, um, there may be a change of, of the public charge rule, which has impacted immigration under this administration, uh, which has an extensive impact on those applying to be a, a green card holder or a temporary visa holder by confirming their um, their, their insurance, their likelihood of being a public charge to the US, their background, education, financial status. And um, the public charge rule has, has made a major impact on cases under this current administration. So there may be a rollback of that rule as well if there is a change in the administration. So I will now turn it back over to the professor for questions. All right, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, both uh, excellent presentations. Um, let's first see, I don't see anything in the Q&A, but if there is someone in the attendees who wants to ask a question, uh, you can raise your hand and we might be able to, uh, if Yoshi gives a go ahead, we could uh, uh, promote you to allow you to ask the question without having to type it out. I know that that's a barrier for some people. Okay, I'm not, not seeing a uh, hand just yet, but that's okay. The, it'll stay open. If, if you have a question, please definitely raise your hand. Uh, I have a question for, for Sarah. Um, the, whenever I hear complex regulations like this, I always think about what are the extreme cases? Um, what's a weird thing that I can see is going to happen as a result of this? And, and what is the person wind up in that one? And the one that you described with the uh, increased wage brackets set by regulation. What happens if a worker is pushed by regulation into that higher wage bracket, but the firm can no longer afford to pay, cannot afford to pay the higher wage? Does that mean that the visa becomes invalid and that person has to return home? And what if they're not allowed to return home because of, of quarantine restrictions. Do they become like somebody in a fair to middling Tom Hanks movie? <laughs> well, that's a great question, Professor. And this does impact H-1B extension cases. So in other words, if an employee is already in H-1B status now working for a company and they have an H-1B extension coming up in January of next year, the employer has to go through the H-1B extension process and under these new prevailing wage increases, if their wage does not meet those requirements, they may not be able to proceed or the employer may have to increase their wages or they may have to try to find another type of work visa. Or as you mentioned, if they're not able to file the age extension at all, the person may have to either depart the US or make another type of visa application. Um, many people who are here in the US who have lost their jobs during COVID, for example, have been impacted and they are able to either change to a visitor status for six months, or they're able to ask for some other type of humanitarian request. Um, but other than that, uh, if they remain in the US, they need to, to switch to another status to be able to stay here legally. Okay. Um, I, I, can still see, uh, I can still see Tom Hanks stuck in the airport on that one though. Uh, probably as an immigration attorney, you probably hate that movie, but. I'm sure there's, you, we, there's all kinds of problems with that. I do have an insurance question for Jim. Um, and it may be a little bit about outside of, 
of you know what you feel comfortable commenting on and that's that's fine because uh, it's more of a policy question uh, given how much has been spent already on uh, on uh, payments for uh, COVID relief. Do you think that that either, do you think that increases or decreases the chance that um, we'll get more, that we'll get the passage of a federal backstop for insurance payments as you've discussed? Well, I think to some extent, like if there is another package, for example, that yet it gets passed and the numbers, the numbers of dollars just keep trending up. As I said earlier, I think at some point there's just going to be too much pressure with the national debt and people just saying, look, we just can't can't keep having the federal government put more money out for this. Even but but again, we're at this I feel like we're at a turning point where, you know, a lot of states are opening and people are starting to get back to work. And now starting to kind of pick up the pieces and say, well, you know, here I was closed for eight months. And now I have this huge business income loss and I have, I did get some PPP money to keep my employees on payroll, but I'm still, I still have, you know, staggering losses because I had no income and I paid rent and so forth, but I had coverage for this. Where's my coverage? So I think part of it's going to be how much of an outcry will there be from insured groups, uh, policyholder groups, uh, because we have our lobbyists too to uh, combat the insurance industry lobby to say, look, you know, people pay these premiums. You, you are not just a premium collection company, as, as we like to say on our end, you, you're supposed to pay claims too. And so if there's a lot of pushback from policyholders, big, you know, a lot of big companies are in that group, not just small businesses, uh, then there could be a, enough momentum perhaps to get some kind of federal legislation passed, either with respect to the wording and what's covered under policies or the federal backstop. So you really kind of loosen up the money in the first layer commercial and get the reinsurance money into the game too. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I do have a question from the audience from uh, Zach. Um, I, it's uh, directed towards Sarah primarily because it's an immigration type question. And again, it might be on the policy side rather than the actual um, uh, nuts and bolts, which is what your presentation has been about. Uh, the question I'm going to summarize it here is, uh, has there been a decrease in demand from uh, the Japanese side uh, due to uh, Corona to uh, immigrate for immigration to the United States? Are they fearful of coming to the United States? That's almost not an immigration question, but <laughs> if you want to take a stab at it. Sure, sure. Well, you know, the health concerns obviously um, affect uh, foreign nationals who want to enter the U.S. and, you know, safety concerns. However, the, uh, the demand for work visas, especially from Japanese companies and individuals, has really not decreased at all. Um, before COVID, the, the economy was very, very strong. And in fact, uh, my, my work doubled, um, partly because some of the uh, immigration cases have had requests for evidence on cases. So we actually had to have more work done on cases to get them approved. Um, but then also just the, the increase of entrepreneurs, investors in the U.S., um, the immigration demand has been very high for Japanese companies uh, who want to come to the U.S. and who want to bring their employees to the U.S. The health concerns, of course, are going to be a concern for anyone coming to the U.S. or to travel. And um, hopefully we'll have a vaccine in the next you know, six months or so. Um, but, you know, every case is uh, case specific. So... We do have people coming from the U.S. to other countries outside the U.S., and we have to warn them. If you travel outside the U.S., even if you have a work visa that's already uh, had an approval and visa issuance, you may get stuck in the other country due to quarantine uh, requirements before you can re-enter the U.S. So there's quarantine issues on both sides, and uh, every case is very specific to the current conditions. It's a very fluid situation right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, excellent answer. Um, Thank you, uh, thank you, Zach, for asking. Uh, I do have a question for Jim that's a, also a, a little bit outside the, the procedural, but uh, it's more of a speculation question. Do you feel that uh, COVID is going to bring about 
intermediate or long-term changes in the insurance industry and how it how it's structured in the United States because we've kind of we've hit what we like to t term as a black swan with this um, an unex unanticipated event. Uh, it's not exactly what it means, but I won't bore you with that lecture. Do you think that that COVID is going to bring about a, a long-term change? I think it's going to depend first on whether or not there's going to be broad coverage for these claims. Because right now, of course, they're fighting all of them. They're litigating all of them that, uh, that where the insureds are, are pressing it. So there is going to be a large amount of money that they spend uh, on defense costs, number one. And where they lose these cases, they're going to be pretty significant cases for the most part. Because if you win one in Texas uh, and, and win two or three more, then you pretty much are going to have to cover all the business income losses in the state of Texas and Florida and Iowa and so forth. So I think, I don't think there'll be a change in this, in the basic structure of how insurance is provided. I think it's still going to be mostly through agents and brokers. And I think you're still going to have a front line of, you know, primary and excess commercial insurers in the country you may very well have additional endorsements um, and that may come as soon as you as renewals in 2021 um, depends on how quickly they can get those approved but you, you may very well see broader pandemic type exclusions especially on policies there are very few of those they're all manuscripted now the ones that i've seen uh, there are no i mean i've seen two where it says specifically pandemic type of, you know, catastrophic black swan losses. Um, most most uh, insurers are faced with a virus or bacteria exclusion. And those are really geared toward, you know, wet and dry rot, fungus, mildew, mold, virus, bacteria. That's sort of what was anticipated with that. Uh, it was geared toward that. That's how it was presented to the regulators when they in back in 2006 when they got that endorsement approved through all the different states. Oh, we're not really excluding. Uh, we're not changing the policy. We're not adding an exclusion. We're just documenting what's covered in it now. That's how it was presented to regulators. But of course, that that tune has changed uh, now. So what you may see are are uh, broader exclusions in this area. You might also see, and here's, here's an interesting and potentially challenging area. You might see um, riot, civil commotion, civil unrest, looting. Those are all, as I said, specified causes of loss in your policy. That is covered right now. You may see that pulled. If depending on what, how the situation goes in the country, if there's a lot more unrest and there's a lot more loss in that area, you may very well see that just fundamental provision in policies for riot and civil commotion. You may see that pulled as well. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see them try to scale back on that type of risk because it's, you know, obviously this year, with, along with everything else, then you have those losses, which they really don't have a defense to. I mean, those are just flat out covered. So um, I think you'll see those types of of changes. Uh, again, you're going to see premiums go up. It's going to continue to, this is going to harden the market, I think, substantially, uh, just because of the defense costs alone, let alone having the, you know, the indemnity costs that come with paying the COVID claims. Uh, I, I think you'll see a hardened market. And so reinsurance costs will go up. That means you and me and everybody on this webinar's costs will go up too. So. I would say, and, and this is kind of off, uh, off the topic too, but you know, if you wanted to do something about it, I'd say contact your representatives, contact your state insurance department commissioner, uh, Commissioner King, General King. He's a U.S. Army general as well as being our commissioner, a great person. Um, feel free to contact his office because people, you know, your representatives, if they get enough people saying something about, hey, why isn't something being done about my insurance coverage? Things can happen. So I put that out there as well. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, great answer. Uh, I think uh, I want to ask one more question. Uh, well, and, and I, you might want to take a hard pass on it, and I'll totally understand if you do. But one thing that I noticed that both of you did not talk about is the new composition of the Supreme Court. Do you anticipate that the Supreme Court, as it is currently constituted, uh, constituted, yeah, yeah, constituted, do you think it, how will it impact the issues of immigration and uh, insurance? Uh, why don't we start with uh, Sarah? Well, yes, I mean, the Supreme Court definitely has um, impact on immigration related issues especially on some of these rules that were implemented without going through Congress. And so the different uh, you know, uh, justices will have their opinion and be able to make decisions on if there is a change in the DACA rule, as well as for um, the separation of, of, of family members at the border. Um, you know, if there is a constitutional issue that is uh, impacted by um, any changes by either side, by either the Trump administration or the Biden, if uh, if it, if there are lawsuits and um, you know these new prevailing wage rules, for example, can actually be uh, litigated and pushed up, so it will have an impact um, in one way or the other based based on the new uh, composition of the of the Supreme Court. On the insurance side, I would say it probably doesn't have much impact simply because insurance cases are all litigated in the states. And so you have over the last hundred years, I mean, you have maybe a handful of actual policyholder claims making it up to the US Supreme Court. It's all, you know, you get to the highest state court in the various states and that's where the decisions are made. Um, the only way, place it, it could maybe come into play is if there were a federal law in response to COVID and the coverage crisis. And there was a federal law passed, and then the constitutionality of that law uh, could reach the, the Supreme Court. Um, you know, would that, would that pass muster under, you know, with the current, uh, you know, with the court, current justices on the court? Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna roll the dice on that one. <laughs> That's, you know, probably. I mean, that's certainly within their bailiwick to, to pass such a law. And I think from the constitutional standpoint and the ex post facto law uh, constitutionality argument that the insurance companies would raise, it is you're changing my contract. You cannot pass a law, Congress, that changes my contract. And our response to that is we're not. We're just defining something and your policies most, almost all policies, I mean, 95% of the policies will say specifically, if there is a rule or law or regulation that is passed after this policy is in effect, we will automatically amend our policy to comply with and comport with that statute or that rule or regulation. It's a great, it's a great provision. So you can kind of uh, sidestep the constitutional argument by simply saying, we're not changing your contract. We're changing the law, but your contract changes with it. So that's the argument I would make. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, great answer. Um, we are running short on time, but I did wanna end, uh, if we can, on a positive note. So I just wanted to ask each of you, uh, if you have just, just 30 seconds of something that you see coming down the pike that is that you think is going to be a positive coming out of all of this. Uh, why, don't, uh, why don't we start with uh, Sarah? So I definitely think that immigration is important for all international companies. And Japan just has a, a wealth of entrepreneurs, investors, companies that come into the U.S. So whether or not there's a change in administration, there are visa strategies for Japanese companies and other companies. And it's just important to uh, strategize to look at the quality of your employee's background, their education and credentials, and to make sure that you uh, seek uh, legal counsel to help prepare your cases. 
I can think of something positive in the insurance coverage area, believe it or not, despite all the doom and gloom. I think what this will do, it will cause everybody out there on this webinar to actually go read their policy. Read your policies. It'll make a difference because you're actually, nobody reads these. They're hundred pages long. They come to you from the broker. We pay the premium. You put it in the drawer. Nobody reads it. Read your coverage and actually know what's out there because for a lot of this, you know, it, when you have losses, talk to your broker. And if the broker doesn't give you an answer that's satisfactory, Talk to somebody who, who does what I do and, and make sure that your rights are protected. But go go read your policies. I think people will start doing that because they're going to be getting denial letters. Um, you know, and this is obviously going to be, a, I think, this is going to come into play more to 2021 as these claims really start maturing and you're going to see a lot of litigation. I think it'll be in the media a lot. So I think attention will be drawn. To it. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, the, the true value is not in not making mistakes, but in not repeating the same mistakes. So we're, you know, this is an opportunity to learn. Thank you. Thank you very bo both very much. Uh, great, excellent presentation. I think, Yoshi, you're going to close us out. Oh, no. Uh, on behalf of the Japan America Society of Georgia, I just want to thank uh, everyone uh, for joining in uh, today. Uh, and certainly, uh, Professor Jim Hoadley. Um, or Jim Sensei, right? And then, of course, uh, Jim Leonard, you know, in Japan, actually, all attorneys are senseis too. So, well, we get to call you Jim Sensei this time around. So, thank you very much for your insights on insurance and all the uh, positive things that, that, that could be coming up hard, um, uh, with the election uh, moving forward. And then, Sarah, you're, I know you're an attorney too, and I understand you were also a teacher too. So, so you are a real sensei. So, thank you so much, Sarah Sensei, as well. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, again, for joining. And uh, I know there's there's a whole lot of uncertainties happening right now uh, with, with the COVID pandemic uh, and the elections coming up. But um, I, I think we did hear um, some, some positive things, some things that we can look forward to, too. So at the same time, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, speaking of lights at the end of the tunnel, we do have a lot of uh, wonderful events coming up as well. Uh, tomorrow uh, and Saturday, we do have some Halloween-related programs uh, tomorrow with our young professionals group, we do have a Halloween version of our dinner and a movie. Uh, and we'll be actually um, not only talking about the movie, but we'll also be screening the movie Ghost Roads, a Japanese rock and roll ghost story. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, on Saturday, uh, we do have a virtual uh, language uh, mixer, uh, Nihongo Egokai, practicing your Japanese and English. Uh, next week, after the uh, elections, um, actually on Friday morning, We'll have a webinar on the economic outlook uh, after the 2020 elections. Uh, we do have the head economist from JP Morgan, uh, Mr. Jim Glassman, talking about uh, some things we can look forward to economically uh, moving forward after the elections. Uh, and then we also have two other events coming up in November. Uh, we have a, a collaboration uh, with Taylor English Decisions, uh, exploring Japanese company attraction in Georgia and some of the recruitment uh, strategies uh, and activities that the, the state of Georgia does bring in so many Japanese companies and investment to our state. Uh, and then an uh, art program uh, on November 19th, uh, we have a program on the art in the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, we have the associate curator from the New York Metropolitan uh, Museum of Art to talk about uh, some of the work that they do. Uh, and kind of bring together the Japanese and Americans uh, through art. So a lot of uh, great events coming up. But thank you again to Professor Holy, Jim Sensei, and Sarah Sensei. We appreciate all your help and support very much. And we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Thanks so much. Take care. Be safe, everyone. Bye-bye.